don't clap me. Yeah, the pig jumper. <laughs> <laughs> we'll ask the questions. Well, an introduction like that, where can you go? I love the um that comes just before your names, just as if, have I forgotten who they are, you know? And, and which and, one and, is know, which? Absolutely, <laughs> you, you know, it, it really threw him for a moment there, I it did. I keep worrying about, because I'm, I'm always mentioning Daryl's name first, because I thought, well, I, is that, is that way it's alphabetical and nobody can hear it? <laughs> being, um, you know, being given credit to say the other words, if I deliberately mm. said John's name first, Daryl might feel slightly... You see, he's <laughs> doing it... No. Really See that there was a, there was a like that, no. no. I always make sure I put the alphabet in order. There was a method to our madness, quite clearly. <laughs> it's just that neither Simon, Simon nor I actually know what the method is. You see, we'll eventually work <laughs> it out. Was, uh, uh, we were talking downstairs, Darrell, um, when we were doing something else for the Blue Peter event, because there's a Pink Floyd tribute band coming in at about two o'clock to start rehearsing. So we were just debating how loud the sound check would be. And you told me something I didn't know about you, with the fact that you directed Pink Floyd's first ever TV appearance. Yes, 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 yes. yes. It, was a, it was a series called Look of the Week, which was produced by Arts Features in, in the late 60s, 67 it must have been. And I was doing, I don't know what I was doing, um, something in that department. And they said, oh, can you go and do Look of the Week this week and next week? So I said, oh, OK. And um, uh, all sorts of people turned up in, to be interviewed or, or to plug something uh, in this show called Look of the Week. And one week it was Pink Floyd, next week it was Christopher Isherwood, then it was Mick Jagger, then it was, you know, I mean, it, it just passed across the screens in front of me. And it just happened to be that week Pink Floyd. It and here so, they it are It again. wasn't something that I'd kind of ever imagined, I suppose, you, you guys actually doing, because when looking at your list of credits, at least, you're very drama-based based directors, it seems to me. But I'm sure, as you say, your career must be wider than that. Tell us how, how you both got into directing. John? Um, well, I started as an actor back in 1959 um, and uh, then went to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art for two years, um, came out of there, uh, did uh, some regional rep, theatre as an actor, then joined the Royal Shakespeare Company at Stratford during the famous uh, Wars of the Roses season of 1964. And in fact, it was that that got me into television because when the season finished in September in Stratford, the BBC moved in lock, stock and barrel. They moved out the first 20 rows of the stalls at the Stratford Theatre. They built a huge rostra and brought in all their cameras and filmed the entire cycle, the Wars of the Roses. And I was just um, over the moon about it. I thought it was fantastic. And so I then applied uh, to the BBC and joined them uh, the very next year as a very lowly assistant floor manager. And then spent the next seven years going through all the different jobs, um, uh, assistant floor manager, floor manager, uh, production manager, first assistant, location manager, all that. And then finally started directing in 1973. So that's how I got into it. Absolutely. I mean, you came, I suppose, through the BBC route as well, but in a different way, didn't you, Darrell? Well, I did. <clears throat> um, I think I'm a bit older than John. Anyway, um, I always wanted to be a director, having been brought up on the movies of, of the, um, uh, the, the late 1940s and um, happened to be born and brought up in West London. So I, I had, the, you know, the West End Theatre and films and all the rest of it uh, from Tiny. And... Um, about the age of about 11 or 12, I decided I wanted to be a director. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and um, so, uh, um, much to everyone's surprise, I passed the, the um, 11 plus and went to a grammar school. And then towards uh, the end of that, I wrote around to film studios and theatres and goodness knows what. And the only people that bothered, bothered to reply were the BBC, who said we have vacancies for warehouse boys and Radio Times clerks and... Um, um, Clarks in Lime Grove Studios. So I did. Um, thank I you. That's exactly thank what you very much gone to, do to, to get you oh, a drink. Right, okay, so there you right. are. So thanks, um, Emma. I think I'm all right, really. Um, so from uh, the age of 16, I went from the grammar school straight into Lime Grove as a, as a messenger boy, uh, knowing where I wanted to go. And um, I, what I did eventually, well, I did that for about four or five months, I suppose, at the very most, and then into the bottom rung of the design department at the beginning of '54. Um, so uh, the people that I worked with um, knew that I wanted to be a director all the way along the way. And this, you know, irritating 18-year-old or 17-year-old or whatever it was. 
Uh, but I, of course, at those days, you had to do a national service. So uh, I went off and volunteered for Cyprus and Singapore and Gibraltar and all the trouble spots at the time and got sent to Epping. <laughs> uh, actually, it was North Weald, which is just up the road, but Epping gets a laugh. And um, <laughs> uh, it was at the other end of the central line. And whenever I'd attach myself to a marvelous designer called Stephen Taylor, who died far too young. Uh, and whenever had, he had anything interesting on the floor, a big play with Rudy Cartier or, or whatever, uh, over the weekend, because they were all live in those days, don't forget, um, I would come back and in my RAF uniform would sit with Stephen and Rudy Cartier or whoever and um, work on the Sunday play or music for you or whatever it was. So when I came back um, after National Service... So here comes you. your glasses of thank water, you Thank you, thank you. You have props um, as well. Uh, um, fortunately, uh, this is the end of the story... Um, <laughs> So we only have a couple of hours. You've yeah, oh, good. Um, if you went into national service and you were employed before you went into national service, whoever was employing you before you went in had to take you yeah. back. And that, yeah. was, that was very useful. So I came back into BBC, into the design department, and then some years later, some quite few years later, became a director. Now, now that's interesting uh, you said that in the sense that, I mean, when we were looking at your careers and looking for those credits for designers... It, it, has to, it is sad to say that a lot of those early sort of 50s, 60s shows have been wiped, unfortunately. So, if so, they're so, ever recorded, so, so in the end, a lot was live. But I did actually fi find one thing you designed that, that is quite, quite well known, which was from Adam Adamand. So, so, yeah. so uh, I guess I wanted Mark just to run this very quietly without the sound particularly because I was just very intrigued by this sequence. This is the very first start, to probably the first thing people ever saw this on, on a TV show. And I think it's beautifully designed. I think it really is beautifully designed. But it looks immensely complicated complicated as a design to me and I just wondered how much of it you know it, it would spike your memory in terms of which bits were popped from your brain which bits are maybe from brains of other people working with you so I thought we'll just run this a little and if you have a look at this dowel is this episode, episode one episode one oh, yeah right okay. because because it is it seems it looks like the budget is for millions of pounds for this <laughs> for this like opening sequence and probably you were in the smallest studio in Lime Grove weren't you probably doing this you know on a shooting so Mark just no. just run the just run it quietly no. so have a look at it and just T tell me how, how you as a designer you, you, would ah, get this kind of look. Ah, I, know, I know instantly the answer. Because <laughs> what's fascinating is that you've got all, all kinds of props, you know, in a, uh, sometimes in the foreground while the action's in the background. I mean, it, it's, all, it, it, it's so beautifully designed, I think it is. And it helps the director, it's a gift. I'm afraid you're in for a disappointment. I mean, how, how, big is the <laughs> how big is the studio there where you're trying to, to recreate Windsor Castle and people dancing? Louise, you're the most beautiful woman I've ever met. You're the only one to whom I have ever given my heart. I mean, you've got mirrors and, and you've got Louise, the plants. I'm afraid I just cannot ask you to be mine. You see, my love for you could be used as a weapon to destroy me by the enemies of England. My life is fraught with danger each day and night. Alas, Louise, my resolve is as blue steel. <laughs> Excuse me, would you? Just for a moment. I mean, it's fabulous. You've got balconies, you've got... You've just, got just, just don't go on any farther. <laughs> just don't dig a hole for yourself bigger than you need to. <laughs> I had nothing whatever to do with it. That, that <laughs> <laughs> well, there you are then. <laughs> and with the greatest that comments having you waited to the end. That was you? the pilot. I have no <laughs> idea who designed the pilot. Um, so why is your name on it? Because that's intriguing. Well, because then. the rest of the show was shot new. Right. Was, uh, some of it was reshot. Some of it was, uh, most of it was in the studio in, like, in Television Centre. Um, that, I think, was a location. Some of it was, um, some of it was Ealing. Uh, I did actually do some work at Ealing. Uh, um, Adam Adamant coming out of the block of ice, which of course mm. was a perspex thing, you know, braised together, um, was at Ealing. Um, uh, and various other rods and ends I did at Ealing, but most of it was in, in the studio and television centre. But um, what happened, if we've got time, was that uh, Bill Slater the year before had... had um, done four pilots for possible series. The Anedian Lion, the Regiment... Um, 
sorry, that's nothing, that's a bit late, nothing whatever to do with it. Sorry, yeah, sorry, that's a bit late. C- confused, totally confused. Uh, but he had directed the pilot anyway of, of, of that. Um, and then somebody else directed the first episode of the series, which included a lot of, as I say, of, of reshooting. But that sequence was Did actually you? retained from the yeah. pilot, so I have no idea well, who designed it. it's quite sad then, really, in some ways, that some of your best designing <laughs> credits have ended up on the cutting room floor, as they oh, say, really, you know, because that, yes. that must have been a real, yeah, a real well. blow. It's brilliant. <laughs> Well, that's it. You see, I mean, I mean, I mean this kind of honesty is that we get can't the have truth here. Kind, kind, kind of honesty. I mean, that 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 was the earliest thing I could find anyway that, that you'd yeah. done. I mean, the earliest thing obviously we found of yours, John, was the cornet lesson, which was the play that, oh. that you did. Which I'm going to ask Mark just to cue a bit up. Now, this is a real curiosity. This play is. What do you remember about this play? Because it's a little two-hander and very interesting. This in uh, 1973. I was um, on the staff of the BBC as a uh, first assistant, and the new head of plays, Christopher Morahan, called me in. He said, John, what the bloody hell do you want to do? And I said, I want to direct. He said, fine, I'm putting you on the director's course. Now, at that time, the director's course at the BBC was absolutely incredible. It was three months full time. And you learned to do everything. You were a vision mixer for a week, you were a, a sound editor for a week, you were a dubbing editor for a week, you were a cameraman for a week. You did all the jobs. And at the end of the three months, you had half a day's effort in the studio at the BBC to do a play. And at the time, um, I had a friend called Roy Kendall, who um, I knew was, uh, was very interested in writing. I said, Roy, write me something to do for this course. And he wrote the Cornet Lesson. And um, I cast an actor called Gerald James and an actress called Angela Pleasance. And we did it in uh, the television studio. We had half a day effort to do this. And it was very very interesting because at the time there was a strike at the BBC. And while we were doing this staff training exercise, not for transmission, an in-house exercise, the designers were coming round to the gallery going crazy because all their shows had been cancelled because of the strike. But the strikers thought, what we'll use to keep ourselves ticking over is staff training (laughs) so that no one can ever accuse us of actually not working at all. So I was getting all the effort (laughs) in the studio. I had full lighting, sound, design, everybody for this staff training exercise. It was brilliant. (laughs) So we did that, and then um, the, uh, the powers that be viewed it and thought, well, this, is, um, this must go, uh, this well, must be a broadcast um, well, it, half it's hour interesting. for... Let's have a look uh, at it. Let's have a look at a bit yeah, of it. Yeah, and tell yeah, me, yeah, tell me but, uh, <laughs> what you think. So this is the actual staff training. <laughs> I haven't got a copy of this. Hold on, this is the transmission. Yeah, this is the transmission. Yeah. 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 No, no, not at all. I, I thought I'd get you and warm the hall up a bit before you came. With the tune? No, no, the, the paraffin heater. It's a nice tune. Yes. What's it called? Rescue the Perishing. <laughs> yes, it is, really. Well, I'd keep that on if I were you. It's, it's, it's drafty here at the best of times. No, no, it's all right, really. I'm, I'm quite warm anyway. Well, I'm perished. Now, it's a very interesting play in the sense that nothing really happens in it. I mean, it, it's typical of a lot of plays of, of the 70s that I love so much because it's totally character-driven, isn't it? It's, it's powerful yes, in the characters. Yes. But, but if anybody who's expecting a Starsky and Hutch-style ending is going to be no sadly way, disappointed, no aren't no, they? You know? No, it was um, uh, Roy Kendall, the writer, uh, did have an association with the um, Salvation Army. And... Um, I remember at the time, I mean, this is a slightly, slightly deviation of this, but um, in East London there was a big place called Congress Hall, which was the home of um, General Booth, who started the Salvation Army. And in this hall, he used to hold all his hellfire and brimstone speeches. Incredible place. It must have seated about 5,000 people. And... During this, I actually found this location, this hall, which in fact we used for later 
film locations, but the basement of it, of Congress Hall, was a early 18th century orphanage, which was still there. I've still got photographs of this place, and I would go around the basement of Congress Hall, and you'd open a cupboard, and there'd be a whole pile of kiddies' chamber pots, and various washrooms, and the dormitories were huge, with a little tiny grate at the end, and maybe a side of 20 beds on each side. And then the caretaker, I'm deviating a bit, but it's such a lovely story. The caretaker then said, I'll show you something. And he took me to an area in the basement, which was the old bakery. And there was a door, which he opened. And we went out into the most incredible area, which was total darkness. And you were treading on what felt like about 500 years of dust. And it was the exterior of the old orphanage, because General Booth built the hall on top. So you could walk round an early 18th century exterior of an orphanage. Now, in the basement also were piles and piles of notes of Salvation Army in the 1800s. And so it became quite a, a thing to kind of read up all this stuff. And that, that show sparked me off on that, <laughs> OK? Um, and that's why I have a very fond memory of it. Did, did you also do the director's course, Dow? <laughs> no, no, no. I've never been trained for anything. Um, it, I used Apart to from upstaging me, you're very good at upstaging <laughs> me. That, that's, that's good. That's fine. Um, no, I, I, I contributed to a number of uh, director's courses um, as an actor and as a designer. And um, I suppose my flatmate uh, at the time, uh, when he did his course, I appeared in that. And that was somebody called Ridley Scott. Uh, and he wanted to do um, Powers of Glory for his uh, exercise. So we did, he went shooting on Wimbledon Common and shot the First World War on Wimbledon Common. And uh, then we piled into the studio in Riverside and did um, what should have been 30 minutes, uh, put down at about 50. And um, <laughs> I was a, a French officer of some sort. And um, uh, that was enormously entertaining. But no, I didn't do, do any courses. As a, as, a, as, a, um, as a designer, and this is my training course, uh, I sat behind good, bad, and indifferent directors for about 10 years. Uh, and that taught me an awful lot. Uh, how not to behave, and um, uh, you know how to behave, etc. And um, so when I made the jump from the mm. designer's chair in the back to the, to the director's chair in the front, the first thing was <laughs> the monitors seemed so close. I'd never forgotten that. Uh, and that was a, a, a live um, fashion show in in '61 uh, when I, as I say, the people who produced these programs knew I wanted to be a director. So even though I was a designer, they let me uh, direct them unofficially um, but no I mean my, now, my, my, now. my training was on the job as it were I mean, you're lucky here because there's nobody listening you see here at all so you could even be indiscreet if you wanted to and tell us who you thought we were your role models or who perhaps wasn't your role models from those directors I'm just oh, being naughty so um, so, so. well I can really only remember the, the positive ones of course um, <laughs> See, he's very discreet. Isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> discreet. Oh, there was a marvellous man called Michael Elliott who, who um, uh, in five years, directed 30 major television dramas, uh, classic drama, uh, modern drama, all sorts, but mostly sort of classic stuff. Uh, and I worked as an assistant to Stephen Taylor on a number of productions of his and, to, and also with uh, a mad... Russian lady called Natasha Kroll, who I was, I was her <laughs> assistant. She had no idea how to design for a play, <coughs> um, theatre or, or television or anywhere. She'd been head of display at Simpsons in Piccadilly, uh, and she was brought in to sort of give a new look to talks and, and you know, sort of un not drama stuff in television, and she did it very well. And I was her assistant for uh, several years. And, um, and then she decided that, that she wanted... To, she went to Dick Levin, who was the head of the department, and said, Dick, I do a play. I do a play. And uh, so uh, Michael Elliott was doing something called The Lower Depths, which is a famous Russian offering, Yagorki. And um, 
so suddenly we were doing a live production of The Lower Depths in Studio D in Lime Grove, and she had absolutely not a clue what was going on. So anyway, but I, I uh, <laughs> lapped it up and, and watched Michael do what he did and, and the way he spoke to the cast in the rehearsal room and et cetera, et cetera, mm. and, and, and several other productions. And of course, I, I mentioned Rudy Carte already, uh, and, but I learned a hell of a lot from him, from both of them, and then working with Ned Sherin on different sorts of things. Absolutely. I mean, my, my birth, Which my I was coming on to birth. next, absolutely. I was coming on to that next, you know, the fact, the fact that... Shall I just carry Absolutely, on? live <laughs> television certainly seemed to be, be your forte yes. in those days, didn't it? Well, that's all there was. Mm. I mean, you know, things were not recorded. I mean, you, it was live on Tuesday, so you absolutely. did it. Absolutely. You know. I'm hoping Mark might have some late show floating around there somewhere to show us in oh, right. while you're you coming on for a moment. You had this announcement, did you, on the floor of the television studio. And now we go over to BBC One for Play of the Week. And then the floor manager would go, all right, studio, okay. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And that was it. And you were live to how many people? 10 million, 11 yeah. million, 12 million? Live. And you couldn't stop. You couldn't stop. It just no. went through the whole thing. You but could not stop. Most people have been trained in the theatre. So what, you of know, course. So yeah. here yeah. we go. You yeah. know, it's yeah. rather yeah. a bigger audience. I, <laughs> but, but, I interrupted. But, but, no. <laughs> no, just that, that um, Ned, I'd worked with Ned Cherry as a designer. For, because what Ned wanted to do always was to make musicals. He and his co-writer, Carol Brahms, they just wanted to be, make musicals. But he was working in talks or current affairs department in, in BBC. And so they cooked up this thing called That Was The Week That Was. Um, and um, David Frost fronted it, of course, that made you know, millions out of it, incidentally. And, um, <laughs> uh, and then they did, um, I, I occasionally guested on that as designer. Rid did a uh, second series, I think. Um, and then they did uh, not so much program, more a way of life, because the, the, that was the week that was, had been such a success. And they did two series, and the BBC wanted to go around again. And they said, oh, no, we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't. It, we can't bring the roof in every week because there'd been such a tremendous um, noise made by that programme in the papers and the parliament and everywhere um, that it was just impossible to follow. So they said, oh, well, you know, we'll take the heat out of it. You can do it on Friday, Saturday and Sunday. <laughs> so they said, well, that's not, not, that's not, not such much a programme. It's a war, more a way of life. So that's what it was called. So we went out live on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday with different singers. We had uh, Cleo Lane and mm. um, oh, oh, various people, Annie Ross. And, and the, 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 the evening was characterised by the singer. Mm. And your name comes into a lot of, of both BBC Three, of course, which was the other spin off. Well, that, that was came my that. official birthday. And the late show as well. Yeah, well, BBC Three, what happened was after not so much programme, Ned said, Oh, I've asked for you for the autumn again. And I said, uh, oh, not as designer you haven't. I, if I don't break, I was very, very old. I was 28. And um, I said, if, if I don't make the break this year, I'll, I'll, I'll never do it, you know. He says, oh, yes, you want to be a director. Mm, yes. So a piece of paper went up very high in the BBC and landed on the head of design's desk. And it said, you will loan Daryl Blake to Ned Sherry for six months. And I was directing the pilot of BBC Three, which was just a scramble through. And then we were live every, every night for every week, sorry. Uh, for six months. Let's have a little look at the Late Show, and, and, and it will give you. Oh, the, the, the Late the Show followed BBC Three. The Late Show Absolutely. was after Ned had gone off to the movies, and we were all left. You that know, fine tradition, really, of satire and music and the, slight uh, anarchy, as you said. The um, we were now, all on, on our BBC own. One, The Late Show, followed <laughs> by thirty minutes with Johnny Mathis. On BBC Two, after the news summary, late night lineup. Good evening. You may have noticed that the Radio Times this week contains a cookery supplement attributed to Barbara Mullen, the retired Irish leprechaun who is currently appearing to cook for Dr. Finlay. The Leach Show now therefore proudly presents George Brown's own colourful throwaway pull-out appendix on colourful cookery. <laughs> oh, hello, hello, hello. Uh, now, 
He's my assistant. Get out of the way. During my last two years in the government, both as Minister for Economic Affairs and as Foreign Secretary, I have attended a good many dinners, luncheons and banquets. Now, these are all thought to be very memorable affairs. Strangely enough, I find myself I hardly ever remember anything about them, <laughs> even the day after they take place. But you do sometimes stumble across some lovely dishes there and... Is it as anarchic as it looks, or is it all very, very carefully scripted, <laughs> carefully plotted along the way? <laughs> it's all very carefully, but I've absolutely no memory of that at all. Um, uh, no, I mean, John Bird is an absolutely wonderful actor, was and is. Uh, John Wells is a complete amateur, um, and he used to do terrible things to me uh, on a live show. Uh, I can remember on one occasion he was dressed up as a, card a sort of 15th century cardinal or something. <laughs> And suddenly said in the middle of a sketch, did I hear a phone? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then the other, uh, John Bird, I think, was with him and said, no, 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 no. And then he went on and said something else. And he said, is that a plane? <laughs> I, 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 it, was, it was just absolutely ridiculous. And, uh, but anyway, I, I smacked him and, and he didn't do it again, as I remember. But anyway, he, they, they were all, needless mm. to say, wonderful people to work with. So once you'd finished that kind of period, I, I guess you, 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 you moved on. To, I mean, was it then your ambition to get into doing drama? Was that what you wanted to do? I mean, clearly you were there already, John, and you were doing the drama by then, but did you also we're want still to in the 60s. Get, it, get into doing not, the drama He's not born yet. I mean, we're, we're <laughs> <laughs> well, presumably you two did bump into each other in the BBC. Never, ever. Well, look, no, I have really? to say at this point, you see, okay, the most marvellous thing about this job is that you never, ever, ever become an expert. Never, because you're always learning new things. Every new thing you do, every play you do, every documentary you do is something new. And that's what keeps you young, OK? I don't know how old you are, but I'm 71. So am I. Okay, great. <laughs> cheer, cheer. No, but that's it, because there's always something that you're keen on and, you, you, and that you want to learn. And the thing is that, you, that this job, you never stop. You must never, ever stop. You carry on until you drop. That's what you do. <laughs> right. Okay, where were we? Well, I'm just thinking because, because, I'm, because I, I mean, I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, looking at, uh, looking at, like, literally, at just what the, t the Radio Times says. There's, there's think that period around 1972 where you're doing both Rainbow and Doomwatch, and I think, I think you, you can't get a much bigger contrast oh, as a director yeah. than, than, than w working with Zippy one day, you know. Well. Um, is, is, is that the nature of the job, really, in well, some sense? The challenge is different every time, the expectation I'll try is different. and keep it short. Um, after the, the Saturday evening satire bit, <coughs> so BBC Three was my birth, official birth as a director, thanks to Ned, he went off to the movies with The Late Show, uh, and then I decided I wanted to teach myself to make movies. And at that time, late 60s, um, Arts Features was Indulgence Corner. It really was. Uh, and Ken Russell and you know, Jonathan Miller and everybody was working there and running around the world and spending the BBC money. And I thought, oh, that's, that's the place to be. And then 10 years before, I had worked as a junior on Monitor, the, the sort of the, the grandfather of all the arts programmes. And a, a, a young PA on that was, was Humphrey Burton. And by this time, end of the 60s, he was head of music and arts. So I saw him in a corridor and said, uh, you know, I'd love to come to your department. He said, well, there's, there's a job on the board, apply, apply. Oh, it's closed. Oh, don't worry, apply for it. And um, it was a producer, Arts Features, so I applied for it and got it without a board, which is quite extraordinary in the BBC. By the time I actually arrived in, in department, he'd gone off to start London Weekend Television. There was a whole heap of us with nothing to do, so we were put on a magazine programme called Release, and I then went round the world teaching myself to make films in Mexico, everywhere, uh, on, on you know, architects, actors, writers, whatever. And then uh, we come to 1970, and I decided to come into drama and wrote to Terry Dudley, who Absolutely. I worked with as a designer, and said I would love to come to drama series. And he wrote back saying, we're watching your career with interest. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing for you at the moment, but keep in touch. And about a fortnight later, I saw him in the bar, and he said, well, I've got something for you. And it was a do much. But I had to get from... I had to go freelance to get from Ken's house, which was Kensington House, which was the right. arts features area, into drama series, which was in Television Centre. Uh, and so I went freelance, just as the twins were born in 1970. <laughs> um, and uh, did 
two years solid in, in drama series. Mm. Um, do much, an Eden Lion, the Regiment, uh, Shadow of the Tower, Paul Temple. And it was it, it just went like that, you know. I accepted everything mm. that was offered because mm. I did, I'd never been freelance before, and I thought, you know, you just said yes to everything. <laughs> and at one point, I was directing three shows at once. I mean, it was absolutely <laughs> bizarre. You know, people, production teams were queuing up at the door to talk to me. <laughs> and because I just said yes to everything. And, um, uh, and then fell exhausted at the end of two mm. years, took a mm. month's holiday and came back to nothing and then went to Thames. Absolutely. To do. Um, uh, oh God. You went on to the highbrow stuff, didn't you? Like Rainbow. Uh, no, no, no. The Rainbow, Rainbow was later. Um, oh God, what was it called? That, that kid's thing about the... the Ace of Wands, bless you, thank you. Um, Ace of I've Wands. I've never heard of that before. Uh, which is, which is um, um, just recently been reissued on DVD, uh, which is how I met Simon. Absolutely. And um, He lurks in some very strange corners. He does, he so does. Um, and then Rainbow and one-shot plays and mm. adult series. Uh, I didn't know, but I was, I was causing a terrible furor at, at, at Thames because I was basically in Jordan's programmes doing these rainbows and odd bits of drama and so forth and doing the one-shot plays. And the, the directors in um, Jordan's programmes hated me because I was doing these adult drama things and the people in drama hated me because I was mm. devaluing the coin by working for children's programmes. <laughs> I didn't know that, of course, until years mm. afterwards. I mean, you know, it was and it's, just, and just it, dark. It's quite, it, I suppose it, it's weird in some ways that years later, you know, uh, people remember Ace of Wands, and, and as you probably have realised by now, it, it's got a massive cult following to it. And yet there's one-shot plays that in many regards were probably what you might regard as your better work in some, in some ways, mm. are largely forgotten, you know, and oh, that, that's yeah. a great, great shame, I think, you know. I mean, it was lovely to see so many people going out there and watching that Armchair 30 out, out, out there in the bar, you know. And, yeah. and certainly, I mean, when I looked through some of your careers, I mean, like, I think, John, probably for you, I mean, your single play stand out to me, if you like, as, uh, as achievements, if you like, more than your sort of work on things like Strangers or The Bill or Casualty, you know what I mean, because... because uh, in terms of, of of the acclaim they got at the time, things like your you know your iris in the traffic, ruby in the rain were in, in, immensely immensely powerful. I think, weren't they? You know. Yes. Well, the the, the one off is is always more interesting to do, as I'm sure Daryl will uh, agree with that. Because as a director, you have more control over it. You're not actually bound by what's gone before. Um, you know, in any kind of series that that you do, there are certain things that you have to stick to. Received um, casting. Pardon? Received casting. Yes, yes. So I mean, you you suddenly can't, you know, with say a cast of Coronation Street, or East Enders, you can't suddenly say to them, oh well, can you do this? Can you do that? Because they know the characters far better than you do. <laughs> okay, so it would be a mistake. But with a one-off, you've got far more control, um, and more satisfaction. I I find and. Um, and Let's have a little look at Iris in the traffic. Yeah. We've in the rain if we can. If Mark is is ready at all. Yeah, yeah. Are you all set, sir? Be good. Oh, no, 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 well, well see, see, one second. He's leaping around, you see, he's enjoying himself. The, the interesting about this is that, I mean, this struck me, I mean, obviously, the, the Troubles, uh, it's, it's not Northern Ireland based, isn't it, was, and still is in some ways, a very politically contentious well, issue. Well, it was shot during the yeah, Troubles. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, you know, uh, and, and in some ways, parallels to uh, the, the, the doing what you're going to talk about later, Dal, the sex and violence one as well. I mean, I mean, how great was the politics on you people as directors, you know, when you were trying to do work like this to sort of push you in certain directions and it, it was wisdom. it was very scary really because the whole atmosphere in northern ireland was was terrible because wherever you were whether you were having a drink in a local pub or whatever there was always someone up at the bar saying to the landlord who is that what's he doing here is he from mi5 is he what you know because with an english accent for god's sake so it was very scary um and i do remember one time which i still can't work out but i was in the europa hotel which is the big hotel in Belfast, which it was forever bombed every other week. And I was sitting in the, uh, uh, it was the big bar with lots of people. It was quite crowded. And I'd arranged to interview a Belfast actor for the part of a policeman. And I'd arranged it in the bar because I, n I never like interviewing actors in, in an office situation. I always take them to a bar or whatever. And so I interviewed this guy, and I was having a long chat with this guy about what his role was in this play. 
that he was to do this, he was to do that, and blah, 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 blah. And he, we finished the conversation, we shook hands, and he left, and I went back to my drink. And a guy came over from the corner. I still can't work this out. And he said, um, in this strong Irish accent, I'd just like to say that I didn't hear a word of what you were saying to that man. Now, Ireland's a very strange place. <laughs> <laughs> But it was scary. Here we are then. Here's a clip from this play for today. Beautifully shot. I don't know whether you get it out the back of the Land Rover, yeah, but I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. it was it was written by a man called Stuart Parker, who sadly died some years ago. Um, but um, the thing about good writing is that well, it's as Alfred Hitchcock says: the three most important things when you're making a film is a good script, a good script, and a good script. And you you really can't fail if you've got a good script. And that was a brilliant script. And, I, you know, okay, I mean, I did my job as a director, but I didn't, I didn't have to do an awful lot because it was all there. And you just followed the script, and uh, it was uh, a brilliant piece of writing. It's a powerful pe piece of television, or film, in fact, because I mean, it, could easy, it could be a cinema film, I suppose because it shows the ordinariness, in some ways, of life in Northern Ireland, trying to carry on in that That's kind right. of chaos, almost, around That's it, right. you know. Yes. Um, but, 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 but I would have thought, though, that, I mean, I, mean, I guess, I mean, the media is probably regarded as being fairly impartial, probably, in the Troubles, so, but, but putting yourself in the back of, a, of a, an army van like that, I mean, I just wondered about the issues of filming it. But this is it, the power of drama, you, know, you see. How um, easy was it to shoot something like that, you know? Well, um, a lot of those street scenes we had to shoot in Liverpool. Uh, and, of course, there's a very strong association between Liverpool and Ireland, because most of Liverpool is Irish. Um, uh, but uh, we did go to Belfast for some... Th the main scene we did in Belfast, the Irish are so pro-filming, they love it. They love anything to do with drama. They closed down Belfast city centre for us. Now, can you imagine that happening in London or anywhere, or in Stourbridge or anywhere? They closed the city centre for a film sequence. Was it all film? The, 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 was the whole thing was film. Film, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but that was great. But mm. there were certain things which involved troops, uh, which uh, we could not do in Belfast. So we had to do that in Liverpool. I'm just interested in what, what do you prefer as directors? Do you prefer working on film, working on videotape? Because certainly down where you seem to do a lot, a lot more on videotape, probably it seemed to me. Well, I was lucky uh, in where are we now? Sort of 70s, I suppose. Um, I hate as. A, because I had been a designer, I hated um, working in productions where you had five minutes on film and then you cut to the studio, which was on tape. And uh, uh, everybody used to sit in there and say, oh, cue anticlimax. <laughs> and, and, and you know, it was just different. So uh, when I became a director and worked in drama, I managed after a time, and it went on for 10 years, I couldn't believe my luck, I managed to persuade whoever was employing me to either to go all film, all tape. Now, <laughs> since you had to have studios and tape anyway, they generally opted for all tape, which is why I got the reputation for fast turnaround tape director. <laughs> but sometimes it was, it, it was all film, you know. But I, I just hated what I call pie-board productions, you know, when, when one was 
you know, the exteriors were. And also the, the, the film sequences were always cut within an inch of their lives, you know, and dubbed and had music on and all the sort of the rest of it. <laughs> and, the, and, and the studio was, it was the same pair of eyes that were directing it, but somehow the machine got hold of you, you know, and, and mm. didn't l- allow mm. you to do what you wanted to do. How about so, you, John? Did you prefer film or video time? You were? Um, it's a very good question, this, um, because, uh, you know, coming from a theatre background, there's still part of me that loves the whole theatricality of television. And there is room... you mean studio video time. Well, yes, there is room for that, I think, and yeah. I think we've lost that now because um, companies are so paranoid about losing viewers that you have to have, for example, music behind everything. Mm. And what is wonderful is to see something like yours out there where there's no music. Because when there's no music, you're drawn into the screen. What's going to happen next? Who, what's he going to say? What's she going to say? And it's so powerful. If you put music behind everything, it's a, like a, 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 a wallpaper. It's, it's mundane. And um, I think the broadcasters have really, in a way, shot themselves in the foot by doing this. Because it's a bit like when you go into a pub. The powers that be in, 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 in the pub business actually give you Muzak because they think that will make customers feel, oh, this is rather nice, you know, this is rather friendly and all that sort of But in fact, nine times out of ten, it makes you feel terribly lonely. <laughs> in fact, the great thing in a pub is to hear conversation. That makes you feel happy, you know. And it's in a, a similar way, it's the same with television, I think. So, as I said, part of me likes the theatricality of it. Um, but I have to say that film... 16 millimeter film, 35 millimeter film, to actually pick it up and look at it and cut it is fantastic. It really is. And the quality of film is so great. I mean, HD, high definition video, it's what Jack Gold always calls democratic because everything in the screen is kind of the same value. Mm. But with film, with the, the whole process, the whole chemical process of film. Where you light it and print it. You, you get sort of depth. You, you can concentrate on maybe four grand, even the background. But it's, it's such a wonderful thing to work with. Um, so I don't quite know what the answer to that question <laughs> no, is. No, no, I, th- I, I think, think that, that's absolutely true, that, that in terms of the difference of mediums, I mean, I, mean, I guess... I, 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 sadly, of kaleidoscope amongst its many things, it does you know catalogues a lot of the output of television, and I, so I have debates now with people: is that real film? Is that is that filmized? You know, you know, a videotape shot to look like film, you know, or is it videotape? And I can still spot the difference between film mm. and and, and yes. things that are filmized, but a lot of people can't. You know, mm. people like my mum has no idea at all if Doctors is shot on videotape or film. Yeah. You know, but but I think you're right. You can see that that kind of difference, and I would rather they would just be honest and say it's videotape or film and not try and make everything look like film because uh, I guess they're putting assumptions on there that viewers think that film is somehow better than videotape and that is not the case you know you know you you can shoot an equally good image in both but your script as you said is actually your real bottom dollar what makes a program a program is the quality of the writing yes you know but you say people don't know the difference but I think a lot of people do know the difference subconsciously I think something clicks in which isn't quite right or isn't quite satisfying. Um, I mean, if I can give an example of that very, very quickly, I, I, did, I did one show where um, it involved a group of 23 people. I can't remember what the play was even, but I remember that we had to shoot this group of 23 people and we had to do a retake. And while we were preparing for the retake, one of those people must have actually gone to the loo. So therefore, when we came to the shot again, there were only 22. And when we came to come to the editing suite, we couldn't cut it together. And the editor was looking at, I was looking at it, it should cut, it should cut with the other shots. Why doesn't it cut together? We brought in other e- editors. Why doesn't the shot cut together? Hold on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, <laughs> So it triggers off something in the brain. This isn't quite right. And that's the power of the eye. The eye is incredible to notice that difference, that nanosecond. And I think it's the same with, you know, whether it's on film or tape or whatever. They do know deep down 
And I think mm. it's a kind of dissatisfaction mm. that you get a slightly down feeling if something isn't mm. quite right or if it, it could mm. be better than it was, mm. you know. Yeah. You, you did various, various genres in your time, even within, within drama. I mean, certainly both of you have done period adaptations, things set in the past, the regiment, the poros you talked about, you know, part of Miss Jean Brodie, which we're going to have a look at in just a moment. You know, you've also done, in some cases, science fiction. You did your Ace of Wands and your, your fantasy shows, you know. Were there particular genres you particularly enjoyed doing? You know, did you particularly want to do historical or contemporary? Where was your real, your real passion? Um, oh golly! Uh, what a question. I, um, I, I think I was happier. I was happier in in sort of period stuff, having been originally a designer and and stuff. And so I would I would whatever you whatever you were pitched into by luck or bad judgment or whatever, um, you you went into that world and researched it and cl it, it closed behind you hopefully and you did it as John was saying earlier. Whatever you do. Whatever a script you're handed, there's always something new in it. it you know, it's suddenly you're giving, given a script about a merchant bank, and you know absolutely nothing about merchant banks, and you go and learn about, you know, how they how they behave, and um, all sorts of other things. You know, the regiment, for instance. Mm. You know, one had to research the, the what they were like in Victorian times, etc. Um, and so, therefore, you're putting on, um, you know, a whole new world when you when you do whatever play you're doing. Um, and so I was happier uh, uh, with the sort of period stuff, I think, really. I never, ever did a police drama. <laughs> Not even <laughs> as a designer was I involved <laughs> ever in a police show. Just accident, I think, really, you know. Um, and as a designer, I did quite a bit of sort of uh, situation comedy, mm. uh, which I enjoyed enormously. And worked with, you know, David Croft and Michael Mills and all sorts of other people in those 70s and 60s. Um, uh, but... To answer your question, I think that, mm. the, you know... The how, how about you, John? Uh, you sorry, to just finish that. No, I mean, no. I, I, but the last 20 years, I suppose, of my career, I was in the soaps. So that was, you know, present-day stuff, absolutely present-day stuff. But still, you're learning about, you know, the, uh, knife fights in the East End or, or, you know, the Catholic Protestant divide in Liverpool if you're doing Brookside and all, all mm. the rest of mm. it, you know. So you're, you're still putting on a whole new scene, you know. Mm. Yes, well, of course, the great thing about uh, uh, period and costume drama, like uh, uh, I did Woman in White, I did Parnell, um, it is the research, it is mm. finding out about how people used to live and so forth and all that that entails. But what I really love doing and what I think we need far more today is we need more plays about um, our present day situations, uh, with young people, whatever, old people, middle-aged people, whatever. But um, we need to know, to learn more about the society in which we live. And I think, um, I think for me that was more powerful back in the 70s and 80s and well, the the 90s than it is now. The, mm. the, the, the television producers or, or uh, broadcasters will tell you that the soaps have taken over that. Absolutely, yes. Mm. yes. I'm, I'm going to bring in a clip here of the Prime Miss Jean Brodie, which you did for Scottish TV in 1978. Because, because I, 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 well, we'll watch the clip then and then I'll talk. Go on, Mark, I'll let you. Yes? Mrs. Duncan. I am Mrs. Duncan. And I am Miss Brodie, Mary's teacher. What do you want? I've come to see Mary. I'm afraid that's not possible. You must call again another day. You mean she's not here? Oh, yes, she's here. Very much so. But I'm afraid you can't see her, Miss Brodie. I don't understand. Is she ill? No. She's in disgrace. In all my days, I've never seen such wickedness in a child. Mary? Wickedness doesn't sound much in Mary's line. Oh, does it not? Well... Whatever she's done, I think I should talk to her. In your presence, if you wish. No, I will not have interference. Good day, Miss Brodie. I insist. Insist all you like. I bid you good day. Mrs. Duncan. Is that I am here yeah. at Mr. Rich's request. He asked that I visit Mary. I journeyed out of my way to do so. <laughs> now today, I mean, they would shoot that all on film, wouldn't they? They would say it's a period drama, we've got to have a £2 million budget for it. There must be 400 extras walking past the street behind it, you know, you know and, and you would lose the, 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 the dramatic focus almost, you know, of those close-ups on the faces. 
And yet, to me, that was very, very powerful. Oh, yes, yes. Well, two good actors. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I, 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 just, I, I just wonder whether, you know, this obsession that has developed with things being on film or looking like film, you know, and everything has to look on film, um, as you said, has, has reduced that contemporary, <coughs> that contemporariness. Those kind of boys in the black stuff type plays right. that were about real life now yes. seem to have gone, don't they? Absolutely, in many regards, yes. You know? yes. And, and that's what I would like to see come back again, really. Uh, but as you say, yes, it's, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the accent is, is on soaps. Um, which is a shame. Mm. Well, it, insure the, it insures the audience and insures the advertising and um, you know advertising yeah, money. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's why they're there. And I guess both of you, to a certain extent, got trapped in that towards the ends of your careers, didn't you? That kind of soap treadmill, which does, I suppose, offer regular work, but also said so the other work isn't there because everyone's become obsessed that's right. by it. That's right. It's because yeah. you know, when you get to our ripe old age, you, yes. you you want to actually choose what you want to do. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And and the choice is very restricted now. Yeah. Isn't it? No, I, I was certainly trapped. I mean, I was certainly trapped. But I, I don't think John's ever been trapped. He's a posh director. I mean. I, I, <laughs> Why do you say that? I'm interested to why you say that. To, to, well, because it, 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 did to see themselves in a class divide type of situation. Eventually, then. yes. Um, <laughs> uh, because I, as I say, I got this reputation for being able to cope with fast turnaround video stuff, and that's the soap now. So you know, um, I had a year out virtually writing a play and did it in the theatre and so forth, and then I suddenly realised uh, the October of that year that I hadn't earned any money. And uh, um, my ex-agent rang up and said, do you want to do Crossroads? And I said, how dare you? <laughs> put, put the phone down and uh, walked about four paces away from the phone. I thought, I haven't earned any money since January. <laughs> so I, I rang him back and I was in front of Jack Barton before I could say Jack Barton and, and <laughs> went on to Crossroads for, I don't know, three months or something. I had a ball. I mean, thoroughly enjoyed it. The scenery didn't wobble. They knew the lines. <laughs> it wasn't, you know, what you've heard about it. It's just not true. And of course, they asked me back and back. And then, as soon as my name appeared on that, uh, I was, you know, asked to do Doctor Who and Emma Dale and, and you know, The Street and mm -hmm. all the others, you know. Mm -hmm. It's interesting but, uh, how until you put that Doctor point, Who into the soaps category. Yeah. It's interesting. Well, it was fast yeah. turnaround video was, drama was, yeah. at that time. I mean, talking about seventies, you know, and uh, um, so. Um, I, I just never stopped. I mean, I ran from Emma Dale to, you know, to Crossroads to take the high road in Glasgow or whatever, you know, and eventually to Brookside, of course, which I did for 15 years. So, uh, you know, you just get that mm. reputation. Whereas, mm. you know, knowing him only as a, a fellow councillor in the Directors Guild, I thought of John as a, as a one-shot play director, you know, and he would come in and... <laughs> <laughs> talk you about your motivation, did you, John? <laughs> What's my motivation? <laughs> talk about... I tried on the actor's name now, but anyway, Parnell. Parnell. Trevor Eve. Trevor, Trevor Eve. Eve. Oh, Trevor Come Eve. in and cry on my shoulder about <laughs> Trevor Eve. <laughs> <laughs> that I remember. <laughs> no, I have to say this, talking about Trevor Eve. I, can th I mean, I spent a year on that uh, Parnell and the English woman, um, working with Trevor Eve and a lot of other actors. But I have to say, at the end of the day, there is no other actor in this country who I know could have played that part. Mm. He was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And then I rest my case. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got no hair at the end of it, though, you see. But there is that trade-off some, some, sometimes, as it were. I'm going to let the audience ask a few questions here. I've got a few more to go. But let's see. Anyone want to ask Daryl or John anything at this stage? Go on, Pete. Pete? Yeah, yeah. Daryl, please please tell us something or anything about working on Quatermass 2. Quatermass 2, yes. Well, I, 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 I said earlier on... Um, that I had attached myself to a marvellous designer called Stephen Taylor. And, <clears throat> and uh, he was absolutely brilliant. And, um, of course, Creative Mass 1 had been, a, you know, the first series had been a tremendous success. And they went around, they wanted to go around again. Uh, and Tom Neal, <clears throat> as he was known, uh, wrote another series. And it was in Studio G, Lime Grove, uh, which is a long, thin, strange place. And... Um, uh, Stephen was a designer, and it had fourpence, you know. I mean, it was, it was, I suppose, quite a good budget for television drama in those days, but it was a serial, so it wasn't a posh play, so it was, you know, not very well endowed with money. 
and um, and I assisted Stephen on it. You know, I mean, it was sort of voluntary. I mean, I, it was at the weekend. It must have been live at the weekend because I remember going into the studio with him and not missing my job. I was actually in the print room at that time, printing off all the uh, plans and elevations of all the sets uh, in the design department. That was my first job in the design department. And um, uh, I can remember all sorts of things about the, the, the being on the floor with it, you know. Uh, um, Paddy Russell was the AFM. And, uh, you know, there were those, I used to call them Cornish pasties that came from outer space and <laughs> landed. <laughs> And they sort of opened and a puff of smoke came out, sorry. <laughs> you know. Well, that was Paddy with a cigarette. And they, they, were, they, were, they were on a table. And somebody, Jack Kine or Bernard Wilkie, pulled a string and they sort of opened. And she went... <laughs> <laughs> and this <laughs> cigarette smoke came out of the Cornish pasty. And distinguished members of equity were, you know had this scar on their, on their necks. <laughs> I mean, I can remember uh, looking at, you know, I'm fascinated by old British movies, and I'm afraid I'm a bit of a you know, bore on those subjects, but people I see in those movies in the 30s and 40s, I worked with in the 50s, you know, like Austin Trevor and various other people in, in, in that very series, you know. Hugh Griffith was a nightmare. Um, <laughs> um, John Robinson was playing, of course, Quatermass because the other guy died. Reginald, somebody or other, and, um, and John Robinson simply could not cope with, with all the technical stuff. So he carried a clipboard most of the time, I remember. Uh, I, I, he certainly carried a clipboard throughout rehearsals. I saw very recently, um, possibly somebody here sent me the recording um, <laughs> of, of Quatermass 2, and um, to my great surprise, John carried a clipboard in about one scene. So. <laughs> My memory is that he carried it all the time. I think it must have only been in rehearsal, so that so that you know they could, so that the cuts were were rehearsed. You know, because mm. the the vision mixer's script is is very tightly on the dialogue. You know, and he was giving his best to give the dialogue accurately in the rehearsal. You know, but put it down for the take, Fantastic. a live transmission. I beg your pardon, mm. um, but yes, I mean all. all, all Sets were tiny. There came a point where the rocket went to another planet, didn't it? Um, at one point. And I remember going to the studio on that week, and there was a sort of space in the studio at the other end of Studio G. And the rocket was under the gallery at that end. And um, uh, there was this sort of empty space. And Stephen said to me, Can you go and get all the nesting chairs you can find? So, okay. And I went around the building stealing nesting chairs from. <laughs> He said, just, just throw them on the floor. Okay, I threw them on the floor. And he got some green tarpaulins, big tarpaulins, and just threw them over these nesting chairs. And that gave a sort of undulating surface. Of course, it was black and white, you know, and there was a psych around it eventually. And I think there must have been some sort of... He'd, man he'd afforded a rock or something. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw it, you know, as I say recently, watching this Quatermass 2 thing. And it does actually look like the surface of some sort of strange pla <laughs> planet. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just nesting chairs That's under wonderful. under a tarpaulin. You know. That's great. Any more questions? Um, no, we don't, uh, I can't see the faces. Oh, um, go on. Oh, Graham. Yeah, go on, Graham. Um, I just wondered, I've watched these a lot of archive television online and some of them in the book. No, no, because because the crews were so wonderful. I mean, uh, they had they had had years of experience of pushing those things around. Over the, the key thing about the studio, a studio, is it has a very smooth floor. Uh, when we worked in Riverside, because uh, right by the river at Hammersmith, um, they, I remember them. I was still a designer at the time, and I remember the crew saying, "You know, it's the most up to date studio in Europe. Daryl, bring out the buckets, because the the roof leaked, <laughs> and, the, and, the, and, the, and the and the and the." Um, uh, the water used to come up, you know, under the floor. And the thing you cannot have in a television studio, as I say, is, is an undulating floor because it shows on the on the shots, you know. No, the crews were were, were wonderful. So, whether you had a mole crane, you had another small crane, you had 
you know, pedestal cameras and things, mm. and they were whizzing mm. about all over the place, and I didn't feel restricted by it. It's an interesting uh, question, though, because, I mean, I mean, if you think about, you said you, you, you kind of got this reputation for being very fast-tracked, and certainly making something the bill towards the end of your career must have been quite a fast process as well. His career Chapman hasn't had a, ended. Had a fast turn. <laughs> <laughs> as I said towards the end, I didn't say the oh, oh, sorry. You know, had a fast turnaround. Presumably that was much easier when you've got the technology that is smaller and lighter, so you can shoot something and move on quickly and shoot something and move on quickly. Yes, yes. Well, well, and well, is there a danger then that writers write something much more fast-paced oh, because yes. the technology... And yes, that actually can detract then maybe from the drama. I don't think so, no. Uh, uh, the camera people on the bill are incredible with handheld. Absolutely fantastic. They really are, and of course the camera equipment now is much, much lighter and much smaller, but they really are terrific. And actually I think to be in amongst people um, and to choreograph it in a, in, a, in a way that's acceptable is very, very exciting. Because what you also get with the handheld is you get just that slight movement which actually makes you feel as if the whole process is alive, that there is some kind anything of heart might, Anything beating. might happen. Yes, yes. So it's not rigid like a floor camera. Um, and as I've said, um, cameramen and women on the bill are terribly good at that. And then, then, of course, writers will look at that and think, oh, great, well, I can actually do this and I can do that. Um, for my money on the bill, the most important thing was... Um, what I used to concentrate on was probably spending um, a good third of the filming day actually rehearsing and then doing a lot of sequences in one shot. Now, if you can actually choreograph a scene which probably lasts two and a half minutes and do it in one take with handheld, it can be very, very exciting. And, of course, it means that you've actually done more than half your quota for the film day because on the bill you reckon to do five, six minutes of cut film a day. If you can do two and a half minutes in one shot, it's worth spending the time on rehearsing that and choreographing it so that it all works. People come into focus, they go out of focus and so forth. Um, and that, for me, is the most exciting thing. And then, it, of course, writers will look at that and think, great, I can do this, I can do that. Mm. Mm. That's fascinating. Let's have a go. Yep, yeah, certainly. I, don't, I can't see the face at all. There you go. Oh, there you go, Ian. <laughs> have you, have you, you've obviously seen it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, just to explain to people, it's, yeah. uh, it's songs that are essentially a man singing a bike. Yeah, it was such a lovely idea. It was written by a man called Robin Chapman. And uh, there again, I mean, you'd never get anything like that on television now. But this was, this was a guy who, he lived with his mother, actually. This is the character in the piece. He lived with his mother, but he was crazy on motorbikes. And he actually came back... Uh, on one, uh, one day with uh, um, and I can't remember the model it was a very famous model of a motorbike something 500 um, which he bought at a, at a sale and he took it into his workshop there was no dialogue in this half hour play no dialogue at all but he started stripping this bike down and as he was stripping it down you kept getting these songs coming in which were various people in his life kind of talking to him, his mother's his mother, the song by his mother came in, the song by his girlfriend came in. He was the only character in it, but all these things kept kind of bombarding him about, you know, grow up. What are you doing? What are you doing working on a silly old motorbike? I mean, why don't you get married? Why don't you have a family? You know, what are you doing? And it was quite interesting, and very interesting, in fact. And it f finished up with him actually renovating this bike and so we finished up at the end of the half hour because we've been through the whole thing of cleaning the pistons and, the, and, and everything. And so there's a lot of close-up work in it. And at the end of it, he'd got this fantastic bike. And he'd bought special gear for it, for this first ride on this bike. And he, all studio, took it out on the Pearly Way bypass <laughs> and started driving down the Pearly White Bible and just went up into the atmosphere. And that was the, e the end of the play. But it was such a lovely idea. Um, but it was, yes, probably the strangest thing I've ever done. <laughs> yes, yes. Was it a half hour? Yeah. yeah, yeah. The Second City First, mm -hmm. was it? Or 
centre play, mm. centre play. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And the BBC Birmingham connection is quite is quite strong, isn't it? Well, I mean, certainly when you worked at ATV, as you said, I mean, you did a lot of work at BBC Birmingham as, as well. And in fact, I think you're still there. Are you working at, up at the moment up here at your BBC Birmingham? Oh, no, that's not to do with the, with the BBC, though. Oh, it's, right, it's right. just an editor I know um, uh, in Broad Street who's doing a bit of work for me. But, uh, no, but of course, Pebble Mill has, uh, has closed down. In fact, Absolutely. They've, they've demolished it. <laughs> um, they do have another centre, but I haven't actually work, work, worked there yet. You're not missing much, it has to be said. And <laughs> it's just a great shame that there's so much around here that was so great, if you like. So no, doc, now doc, it's all in Manchester or Cardiff, it seems to Doctors me. has yeah. its own base, does it? I yes, mean, absolutely. It's, yeah. to do with absolutely. it's yes. based on the, it was based on the Selly Out University site. At one point it was. had its own drama building, as they call it now, you say. Uh, they yes, I, yeah, I think so, yes, yes. But that was a loss. <laughs> absolutely. Yes, they, did a, they did fantastic work there. Absolutely. Um, who was the guy who ran it? David... Rose? Yes, David Rose did fantastic work. And that's where Mike Lee started. Mm. Mike Lee started at Birmingham Studios doing um, half hour plays. Um, Improvised? Yeah, uh, mm. Not quite. <laughs> not quite, no. The BBC couldn't take it then. No, no. no. But that's where he started. So. Mm. So. Uh, yeah, it's interesting you said earlier, Dal, about the fact that you regarded John as being a, as like a, a, posh, plays, a posh plays director. director. director but, you, yeah. but you did your fair share with him. I mean, Sweet Wine of Youth seemed to me to be a real pet project of yours that you did to play. For uh, well, time. yes, it was a play that I... Uh, what happened was that a, a, an actor chum came to me and said he wanted to do a one-man show of the works of Rupert Brooke. And I thought, vain bugger. And um, then looked at it and realised that Rupert Brooke was not the sort of person that you actually thought he was. And, uh, and it, Nigel was actually rather good casting, so, uh, so we put it together, together. And by the time we finished, there were parts for about 11 actors. And um, so we got a, a fringe theatre interested, and they gave us a, an opening date. And, um, and Nigel had been out of work for about a year, and really was very, very, very poor. And he got an offer of a tour, and disappeared off on the tour. So there was I casting this play that had been written for, for him. And got, I was telling John earlier, found a, a marvellous man called Brian Sterner who was absolutely brilliant in it uh, and stopped and became a director subsequently. Um, and uh, had, I think, certainly one of the most enjoyable experiences of my life because I wrote it, I directed it, I designed it. Power, power, mm. and and um, and it was got wonderful notices, and it was and it was even though it was in this tiny eighty seater in Kingston, uh, it was a great success. And Cedric Messina came to see it and said, "I want to do it for television." And we did it for television, and it was damp squib of a performance, I'm afraid. Mm. Uh, but um, and then uh, yes, that, that took three years. I mean, it was seventy nine before we actually recorded it for television. And the one shot plays I did for Thames, uh, one of which was you know. Yeah, side absolutely. I did three for Joan Ketwelch in that. Um, but apart from that, I've only ever done you know series or soaps mm. or, or um, serials. And you have got the dis distinction of having done something that, that, that I, I love, as it were, when I, when, I, when I was younger. Because, I mean, as I said, I've been here for 20 years old this year, which means that, sadly, I must be 20 years old as well, which, <laughs> which is rather worrying. But when, when I was a youngster, when I used to have my tea, I would watch Tucker's Luck. The uh, spin-off from Grange Hill, and and, right. I, and you know, sod all this highbrow stuff. Let's forget all that, all that <laughs> for a moment. Well, when I, I I never realised you'd worked on that until very recently. When I watched yeah. on that, I thought, that's Daryl Blake, and that's very much tied to that contemporary theme of yeah. Boys in the Blacks. Mm. If you talked about yeah. it, it was yeah. very much about yeah. young people, yeah. the youth of today, yeah. facing unemployment. And Mark yeah. is really clever. There might even be a clip of Tucker's Lucky. Because, because I have to get my childhood into this somewhere. Yes, I, I did second and third series as a producer and director. Absolutely. And, and I had nothing to do with the first series, which was really very successful. <laughs> they were all successful. Ta da! My hero! Is everything all right now? Oh, yeah. Come on, we better go and tell them what's been happening. You okay now? Yes. Yeah, sorry about that. It's just that I happened to be on the landing when the lights went out. Oh, no wonder you blew a fuse. Well, it's just a trifle overloaded. Yes, well, just limit yourself in future. Now, now Tucker's luck struck me. Discovery. Absolutely. I mean, Tucker's mm. luck strikes me as being on, even though it was designed, obviously, for, for young people like me at the time, they're very much my youth. 
it could be a repertory theatre. It's played out in that way. It's about five mm. or six characters, and they're interplay, isn't it? Yeah, and it could, yes, could have been yeah. on, on a stage. The, yes. the point, the point of doing it was was that uh, initially was that um, uh, Tucker had been a tremendously successful character in in Grange Hill, of course, when it started, and of course, the fullness of time he went through the school and left school. But the BBC still got sacks of letters saying, "Bring back Tucker, bring back Tucker." You know, they obviously couldn't go back to school. There's a vague thought that he might turn back up, you know, turn up at the school as a PT instructor or something or other, and they thought, no, that's not a good idea. And what was what was really current at that time was was tremendous teenage unemployment. I mean, kids were were you know coming out of school and and going on the dole, and you know, and their parents were on the dole and all the rest of it. But um, teenage unemployment was the reason for doing the first series, and it was a hit. And and um, uh, and. I was asked to do the second and then the third series and, and thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and Todd was, um, Todd Carter, who played, uh, uh, hate, didn't like rehearsal. And then by the, by the he, he, he just, you know, he learnt it at home uh, and he came in and he did it, you know, and, well, I don't want to muck about rehearsal. And, um, and then by the t end, of the end of the series, he said, Daryl, I begin to understand the reason for us. <laughs> <laughs> and as you said, if you look at the cast, actually, all, sort, all kind of people who turned up later in life you know, yes. sort of found their big break, if you like, on the show. Yeah, well, um, I'm very pleased with having cast Adam Cotts, who you saw briefly. In that, mm. that he's had a wonderful career subsequently, you know, in movies and national theatre and so forth, you know. But I should never forget the interview. He, I'd, I'd someone had recommended him to me. I really can't remember who. And he came in and sat down. And I had this tiny office, and he was sitting on the side of the table looking at me. And I described the character, and I described what he, what he did over the series and so forth. And he didn't crack his face. So I did it again, and and you know, and then sort of varied the story a bit. And you know, he has to play guitar, and I'm, I'm this 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 this. He didn't crack his face. And so I did it again. And uh, at the end of it, I, I sort of gave up and said, "Are you hearing me? I mean, are you? Are you? Are you know, do you know what I'm saying?" He said, "Yeah, it sounds fine. Yeah." <laughs> <laughs> he was such a cool customer. He really was. <laughs> Never forget that. But he he turned in a marvelous performance. And um, t Todd was very. <laughs> what I inherited was was. A bit of a problem in that the BBC had, had lost confidence in Todd Carty, and so they had instructed. This has all happened before I arrived. The, the outgoing, but not well, head of department, I suppose it was, had commissioned this next second series, and they said, you know, we're going to have to bring in another character because obviously he can't carry a series, and so this character called Creamy was was invented, which Adam played, and I had explained to him that we had a problem because people switched on to see Todd Carty, you know, Tucker. But Creamy had the, had, the, had the main crack of the whip, so it was going to be quite difficult for me to actually you know, shoot the thing. But the camera was always with Tucker, of course, when Creamy was having fights off stage or whatever, <laughs> which was not quite what was on the page, because they deliberately shaped the thing to, to shift it onto another character, which was, to me was stupid. Phil Redmond had nothing to do with it uh, at that point. He, he just allowed the BBC to go with his character. I think it was on that series. Anyway, he, he, I'd say, uh, he was contracted to assist in whatever way was necessary. And then 48 hours before, I'd sent him scripts, I'd sent him um, schedules, I'd sent him cast lists, nothing. I rang every other day, too busy to speak to me. No, absolutely no contact whatsoever. And about 48 hours before we did start shooting, he arrived in my office with the secretary who took down everything he said and ignored, ignored me. And he was going to sue me, threatened to sue me, because I had not consulted him about anything. <laughs> and I said, but I tried, I tried, I tried to phone you every day, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then he breezed out, and I had a sleepless night. And I said to my secretary the next morning, can I have a look at his contract? And it said, Mr. Phil Redman will assist in uh, all matters, well, must be consulted in all matters artistic. However, the BBC's word is final. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> <laughs> so 
you know, X years later, he employs me, of course, as, as a director. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, 50, a very, very yeah. happy 15 years. On, on, Absolutely. Well, he Absolutely. and I are happy. I mean, the show went down the drain, but, you know. Mm. <laughs> Was there anything that you both felt you really wanted to make that you never got the chance to make? Oh, there are always things. Oh, always, yes. always. You spend years, years finding out something that you really feel so enthusiastic and emotional about that you want to do it. And um, but it's difficult, isn't it? It's very difficult. Very difficult. To get I mean, there, there were the ground. certainly two things that I wanted to do and still do. Uh, too late now. Uh, one was never too late. <laughs> never, never. <laughs> um, Thirty years ago, more. Uh, somebody came to me or came on, on holiday with us actually, and and introduced me to the the notion that uh, 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 Edward de Vere, the seventeenth Earl of Oxford, just might have been William Shakespeare, and he gave me certain amount of evidence and since then I've researched it and researched it and have you got eight hours because um, <laughs> we have, we have. <laughs> no it's, it's it's a fantastic story and it is a very very strong possibility that this man just might have been William Shakespeare so that's something that I want to put on the screen or wanted to put on the screen um, and uh, the other thing was I, for many years I've been you heard me mention earlier that I was sort of a bit of an anorak about uh, British films you know the yesteryear and to a certain extent today. Um, and I wanted to do, and I had it all set up, um, a, a, a series called Riverside Studios, because you can tell the story of the British film industry with Shepperton, Walton, uh, Hammersmith, Teddington, Twickenham, you know, all along the river. And at that time, uh, dear old Riverside Studios had the name on the side, you know, Riverside Studios. It's been painted out now, oh, which is yes. infuriating. Um, and uh, they, of course, it recently it's been back to a, being a, a television studio with, the, um, you know, TFI Friday and all the rest of it. And the, it, that show opened with a marvellous helicopter shot of the, you know, of the, of the building and zooming right in on Riverside Studios. Anyway, I, I digress. But I'm sure there's a series or, or even a one-off. No, it's got to be a series, which tells the story of the... Which is a sad story well, I have to say about the British film industry. I guess I, I, I guess it's probably ripe for that kind of exploitation because I mean, television certainly has an obsession nowadays with filming itself, doesn't it, and doing programs oh, yes, about yes, itself, that yes, kind yes, of yes, moving yeah. wallpaper type of show where you know you're almost parodying yourself. Whether well, that, that's just because it's very cheap to shoot mm. yourself in your own TV studios, you know, yeah. or, 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 or not. But it, it is it's, it's that kind of voyeurism almost, yeah. w w which seems. Well, I, I, it's, it's weird because it, it seems more prevalent now than it, than it has, but if you look at a lot of the old shows, they're not voyeuristic, but they're certainly much closer. I think you shot things a lot closer in those days. You know, like that close-up there on Geraldine McEwen where mm. you really got into the face mm. to see the emotions. Mm. Perhaps that's just my imagination. Mm. You know. Well, I, 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 I would disagree with you. and I think, I think mostly things were rather more distant in those days, you know, 50s, 60s, whatever, armchair theatre, whatever. There were huge close-ups, obviously. But later on, certainly when I was um, into the soaps, we were always told to go closer, go closer, go closer. And in the end, you're, you, know, you, have n <laughs> you have no way of, of bringing the roof in. I mean, in the old days, if you had a, you know, a BCU, um, that was the most startling thing you could do. Yeah. But if you do that in every shot... Yeah. What do you mm. do? It's an eye mm. now. <laughs> <laughs> or a nose or something. And, it, and, and that, that's an interesting comment to make in, in that kind of the fact that now audiences are more desensitised perhaps because they're used to seeing things like that. Uh, because, yeah. of course, both of you, um, through one reason or another, have made programmes that, that never saw the light of day. I mean, you made a centre play called Article 5 oh, wow. that, that hasn't been shown, and, course, mm. and, and, and Sex and Violence, the Doomwatch episode. I mean, do you think those w would be shown nowadays? Would those get made Art now? Yes, well, Article 5 would, yes. 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 I don't know much about Article 5 at all. No, the, 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 this was a play by Brian Phelan, um, and it was about torture. Um, In what context? Uh, well, that the, the Article 5, of course, states that, that nobody should be subjected to inhuman treatment or torture, or so, so, and so on. Um, so Brian Phelan wrote this uh, piece. It was interesting because Christopher Moraghan, the head of plays, it was, it was given to him by Brian Phelan. Christopher then asked me to direct it, but he said, look, I'm not taking this script up to the sixth floor, which you always had to do at the BBC. It would always had to get uh, rubber stamped uh, by the controllers. So Chris was said, we're not going to take it to the sixth floor, we're just going to make it. We'll make it in its entirety, and then I will present it to the sixth floor, and they will be absolutely devastated at this amazing piece of writing. So 
I started doing this piece, and it was set in a in an office in London, which one quite wasn't quite sure what they had to do with, but what they were dealing with was teams of people in threes who were actually paid by foreign governments to go into a country and put down any dissent in order that certain things could be carried out without any problem. And these, these people were expert in torture. They'd been through Vietnam, they'd been through Korea before that. So they knew how to actually get people to, um, you know, to actually do what they were told to do. And they came to this office because they were due to fly, they were coming to Heathrow, they were due to go somewhere else, but there'd been a strike. So they, they forced themselves into this office in London to stay the night. And while they were there, something happened which persuaded this group of people to give a demonstration of the techniques that they would use. And they chose the secretary on which to do it. So it was pretty powerful stuff because it involved electronic treatment, it involved things which they call the parrot's perch, which is actually suspending people on a pole and actually putting electrodes to them. All the things that are happening in Iraq, all those things which the Americans are saying we don't do, all right? So we made all this. <laughs> and then Christopher took it to the top floor to show the controllers. And apparently, I wasn't there, but apparently there was a long silence when it finished, and Alastair said, on no account can this ever be shown. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm. So what we did is we took it to the ICA, which is a theatre in the Strand. No, the Mall. The Mall, thank you. A theatre in the Mall. <laughs> and all the people that had worked on Article 5 were so pro the whole thing and so angry that it had been... Um, uh, uh, cancelled, and so forth, banned, thank you, um, that um, they all actually gave their uh, services for nothing in actually doing it as a theatre version. And we did it at the ICA and we opened on the day that the President of Brazil was going to the castle. So he was going down the mall and we were showing this play. So that was Article 5. Absolutely. I know you're going to talk about, about sex and violence afterwards, Dallas. So I don't want to steal your thunder on that one that particularly, but... Uh, I mean, I guess, I mean, I, th I think, I mean, I guess that fit into a context of things like scum, where there again, they wouldn't let the censorship stop them from doing it. So you, so you found ways to do it, didn't you? In that sense, you know, so your message yes. still got out there. Yes, yes. You know, and in many senses, probably the publicity around it, you know, uh, I suppose was uh, defeated their object. They wanted to bury it quietly. It didn't happen, did it? You didn't get but, buried uh, quietly at all. That's right. And a very Absolutely. powerful piece and a brilliant director. Alan Clark, I mean, mm. Um, mm. you know, he's certainly one of my uh, my heroes, mm. along with Philip Savile, um, but uh, a great director. Absolutely. We've got time for maybe just one or two more questions before we finish. It's been a fascinating insight. Anyone? Pete? Quick question for Dan. What was it like working on Clarence Harry with his clients? Um, well, the extraordinary thing about that was, was that technically, it was, it was wonderful. Um, we had two little Dexian frames, one for you know, the director of the vision mixer. We had two cameras working, uh, and then there was a duplicate Dexian frame, which the, the lighting guy had. Uh, so the sound guy must have been on my Dexian frame, as it were. And that ran all over the ship, all over the car ferry, which had 10 decks. Uh, and the way the cables got from one to another was down the stairwells. So <laughs> you came out of your cabin <laughs> and you went to work. <laughs> you followed the cables <laughs> to the set, um, and we worked in. And we worked when it was uh, going to and fro across the North Sea, and it was between Harwich and Esbjerg in, in Denmark. Esbjerg, Harwich, Esbjerg, Harwich, Esbjerg, Harwich for ten days at a time. And of course, on the on the screen, it was a triangle. It went to Amsterdam as well. So we had two wonderful weeks in Amsterdam before we actually started going on the boat and shot stuff in, in Amsterdam, which I, I'm very fond of Amsterdam, been there several times, working and otherwise. And um, uh, that was great stuff. Um, and then, you, you know, you went, put your uniform on, you went to service, as it were, uh, on the ship. And, oh, I can remember so many, so many things. The trouble was, that, as I started out to say, that, that technically it was 
absolutely wonderful. There was never a second lost for, for technical failure or anything, and the whole thing worked like a dream. Unfortunately, the producer and the script editor aimed rather low with the, with the scripts, so uh, it never really, you know, inflamed the public at all. Mm. Uh, but it produced very, very easily and very quickly, you know, 26 episodes. But, but uh, who on earth had that idea that we're putting Kato Marwa on the top of the boat sunbathing? I mean, in, in the pounding well, 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 yeah. was, it, was it supposed, <laughs> to, be <laughs> a was it supposed that, to be a parody? That, that was, was, well, no, no, no. That has to do with me again. Um, <laughs> that, was, that was series one. I came in for series mm. two and three. Mm. Oh, right. Uh, it's always a good she, excuse. She, she, good she disappeared. But they hadn't told her that they weren't going to use her. And it was terribly embarrassing. Her agent rang up when I was setting up series two and said, when you want Kate to start? And I said, um, uh, have you... I was in the scripts. I knew she wasn't going to be used. And, uh, and I said, have you not spoken to the producer? Or rather, has the producer not spoken to you? So he said, no. So I said, oh, well, um, uh, we're not going with Kate on this show. Oh, that was terribly you know, awful Absolutely. to lose and put me on the spot like that. Absolutely. Or whether the, the agent was just chancing his arm, I don't know. Mm. But uh, poor girl, I mean, I mean she, she probably had enough anyway, but I mean, she, she was not in the <laughs> series two and three that I did. It's not the kind of show to work on if you get seasick, is it really? I mean, oh, no, 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 no. Um, I, I went... There was a, a, another director uh, working first, that's it, and I went on, one, on a trip when he was shooting. And the, the night I happened to be on board with, with, the, with them all, um, the, 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 the officers of the ship gave, gave a you know, marvellous party for the cast and crew and so forth. And I didn't have that much to drink, but I think I must have eaten a poisoned bit of fish or something around it, because I was throwing up such as you would never believe all night and I thought well I'm not going to be able to do this show I mean I obviously can't function if I'm going to be like this so I didn't actually surface until about 11 in the morning and then and then saw the producer and said I'm sorry you're going to have to recast I can't do it this is rubbish and um and I was perfectly all right after that. So I think I must have been had a poison <laughs> bit of fish or something on that first trip because I was fine. I after couldn't that. have done it. I must confess, I, oh. I couldn't have sat in a boat. I used for 10 to take. Days. I used to take a pill. Uh, you, if you took a pill half an hour before we set sail, um, you were okay. But the reason I took it was because I had to get a good night's sleep uh, because you know we were on the set at nine or whatever it was or before that, and you just shooting ten scenes a day, bang, 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 all over the ship. Uh, and if the dress director was, you know, not able to function, then, then the show foundered. But we had a Force 12 gale on one point. I mean, that, that I should never, ever, ever forget. Um, we got into Esbjerg, and the crew, uh, sorry, the cast were on the deck, holding onto the rails and screaming their lines into this howling gale. And then it was our day off, ashore. So, but of course, my, my assistant and I had to go and see the harbour master because we really had to set up in our day off. We had to set up what was being shot the next day, which was a, a, on a trawler out in the North Sea. And overnight, of course, this, this, this Force 12 gale had really smashed up the town and there were ships on their sides on the, on the harbour side. There were 3,000 fish boxes in the high street, which was underwater. Sheep were drowned three miles inland. I mean, it, 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 was, it was just awful. And the government moved in and we had to get out of our hotel. We were stranded because the ship had gone. Um, and uh, it came back on, on the Friday. And I saw four pantechnicans of broken furniture taken off. Uh, and we got back on and went to work. But we had a wonderful time in Esbjerg on, that <laughs> <laughs> on the Wednesday and Thursday because there was nothing to do. We'd shot the scenes that we needed to shoot ashore. And, and there's only, I tell you, there's only one decent restaurant. Well, there was only one decent restaurant in Esbjerg, mm. it's called Sands Restaurant. <laughs> we spent an awful lot of time in there. Derek Folds, a dear friend of mine, was, happened to be in that episode. And he and I and, and Larry Lamb and Mike, and Craigie, as he was known, Michael Craig, um, we had a rather good time on that, on that uh, layoff. <laughs> What, what was the in, in some, well, that was it. Uh, I did, you, I'm going to say I don't need to sit here at all. I could have just like uh, I wasn't joking earlier. I could have sat in the bar, probably. You could you could just talk amongst yourselves because because <laughs> you quite clearly you know know how to spark off each other and actually you know get really into a question. But at the risk of sound like a terrible soundbite, that show busy, it has to be said at mm. times, isn't it? That you never know what you're going to quite get. Absolutely not. It's been yeah. wonderful talking to you. I'm going to say John Bruce and Daryl Blake. I'm going to be reverse alphabetical order just to annoy Simon at this point. Thank you very much for talking to us this afternoon. It's been a delight. I'm sure you, 
The audience will collar you, I'm sure, outside and continue talking to you. We're going to have afternoon tea now, which I hope you'll join us for. And, and then Dan was going to introduce a programme he's brought with us, that they brought with him, I say, that he wanted to show you specially and talk about. And uh, we will carry on doing other things as well. But thank yes. you very much indeed. John Boots and Darrell Black. That wasn't too painful, was it? <laughs>